Hello. A while back, I stumbled across this rather curious looking device, which supposedly will protect your floppy disks from becoming infected with a boot block virus. And I wondered, for the amazing retail price of just under five British pounds, how well will this actually perform? Well, in this video, we'll take a look. So first of all, what is a boot block, let alone a boot block virus? Well, the boot block is the special area of the floppy disk that lives on the first track, that's track zero, and on the lower side of the disk. A normal Amiga double density disk has 11 sectors per track on each side. Whilst called a boot block, the definition of block and sector can get a little bit blurred with floppy disks, because it actually takes up the first two sectors or blocks. This area can contain a small program that allows the disk to automatically start up or boot when inserted. The problem here is, the moment you insert the disk, the Amiga loads this boot block and tries to run it. Nothing wrong with that, but some viruses rewrote that boot block. Although these disks would still appear to behave the same, sometime later you would unfortunately discover the nefarious purpose behind the code change in the new boot block. Before displaying any signs of malice however, the virus would copy itself into memory and continue to execute copying itself over the boot block of disks inserted. Not only would this spread through a disk collection quickly, it would also damage some of the game's disks that had custom bootloaders. So it was always recommended to always keep your disks write protected where possible. But one thing that made this worse was a virus could arrange to keep itself resident in memory, even surviving the reboot of a machine. So let's have a look at this magical device. We'll start by unpackaging it, and it's not really that interesting to look at. It's quite shiny though. So I'll turn off the Amiga, plug it in, and power it back up again. And I'll speed up the booting process a little. It does fit very snugly back there, and I've currently got the switch set to off. Oh, and to help you see what's going on, I'll overlay a capture of the Amiga's output for you to see. The RGB to HDMI adapter is wonderful for this. So, firstly, with the device in the off mode, I'm going to see if it causes any problems. Firstly, I'm going to format a disk, and I've sped this up as I'm sure you don't want to wait for this while it does it. Next, I'm going to try copying some files to it, and again this takes a while so I'm going to speed this up too. With the disk fairly full, I'm now going to finally write a boot block to it. Good, so in the off position everything is exactly how it should be. Ok, so let's switch the protection on and see what happens if I repeat this procedure, and we'll start by formatting the disk again. Now I'm assuming this will prevent it formatting. Ok, this is weird, I can hear the disk being accessed, but the counter didn't increase, probably a software bug. And with it finally finishing, notice the error about it being unable to format cylinder 0. Looking at the disk, we can see it didn't format properly at all, showing up as a non-DOS disk. Clearly, we need to turn that off and try again. This time, I'm just going to do a quick format as we know the disk is good. So, switching it back on again, I'll try and install a boot block. Interesting message, unable to read or write to volume. I'd have expected this just to make the disk write protected. Just to be sure, I'll try that again. Ok, that's more like it. I wonder if the operating system is remembering the state of the write protect rather than checking every single time. This kind of makes sense, you can't normally change the status of the write protect without removing the disk. So let's copy over some files again. Ok, that was unexpected, opening the folder and we get a disk error. But watch this, I'll remove the disk and I'll reinsert it again and reopen the disk. And the disk error's gone. This really does suggest some floppy disk cache is getting confused here. Anyway, I'll copy some files back over and we'll see what happens this time. And once again, I'll speed it up for you. So that's interesting. It kind of finished early. Error 28 means write protected, so something's kicked in. And it's detected it fine and wants us to remove what it's not managed to finish copying. Hmm. I think the next thing we should do is to take a look at what this is actually doing. And we'll use the Amiga test kit to see. So, let's get that boot up and see what's going on. Ok, so we can instantly see the drive being marked as write protected. It's only the lower side that needs protecting. Note how it changes state as I turn the switch on and off. So what happens if I change the drive head? Ok, it stays write protected. Stepping away from track 0 and the drive is no longer write protected. Interesting. Let's try some further writing to the disk to see what happens, but this time I'll do it in Xcopy. I'm going to try formatting the disk and instantly we fail with the disk being write protected. To see what happens, I'll try formatting starting at track 1. Ah, uh, well, even though I'm trying to format from track 1, it does do a seek back to track 0 first and it noticed the write protect again. Now what I don't understand here is the first track, including both sides, contains 22 sectors in total. Two of them for the boot block, but the rest could be used by the file system, and that has me a little concerned. 
So, to test this, I'll write a small program to slowly fill up a disk and see what happens. As you know, the Amiga file system is split into sectors. For the sake of floppy disks, one block is one sector, but on a hard disk this isn't always the case. A double-sided Amiga disk contains 1760 sectors, with two reserved for the boot block, and also for the file system's root block. Each time you create a directory, it takes up an entry in a single sector, so theoretically we should be able to create around 1757 directories before the disk is full. Now at some point it must start writing to sectors on the first cylinder, so there will be one of two outcomes. The first is that the disk suddenly becomes write protected and the remaining folders can't be created. The second is that there will be some kind of verify or disk block error. You can also see the available disk space is decreasing by 512 bytes each time, corresponding to the floppy disk sector size. Now I'm going to speed this up as it really does take a long time. Ironically, there's viruses that used to do this kind of crazy stuff. Oh look, an error on disk block 11, let's try again. Oh, and block 22 as well. And I guess I was right, 49 minutes later, yes 49, look, check some errors on disk block 2, that's right after the boot block. Pressing retry doesn't seem to clear it either, and removing this disk and reinserting it doesn't seem to clear the problem either. So I'm going to turn off the switch, stop the program, remove the disk, let the operating system settle, reinsert the disk and try to carry on. Hmm, more checks and errors. So I wanted to make sure 100% that this is actually caused by the protection device and not a bad disk. After all, 49 minutes of continuous writing has made the disk quite warm. So I'm repeating the test, but this time using the GoTech Go drive you can see mounted on top of the Amiga. However this time, instead of creating folders, I'm going to create a single file and just keep writing to it. And I'll speed this up for you again. Looks like we're still getting errors. And if I keep pressing retry enough, eventually it gets past track 0. Clearly that track 0 is not going to be containing the right data. And just to prove I've done nothing wrong and that my Go drive's working properly, I'm now repeating the last test with the switch turned off. See, it works perfectly. Interesting, so it kind of does what it's supposed to, but it could also corrupt the disk a little bit, so hmm, not so great. Now I think I know how it works, but before I pull it apart, let's all learn a little bit about the floppy drive bus. The Amiga drives are connected using the Shugart pinout configuration, which you can see here. And you'll notice that only the even pin numbers are shown. This is because all the odd pin numbers are actually ground or zero volts. Now if you look closer at the description of all the pins, you'll notice a shorthand version of the name of the pin. And in electronics, that slash in front of the name has a special meaning. It means these signals are inverted, meaning that they're active when connected to ground, not 5 volts. These active low signals are connected to 5 volts when they're off, and to keep them this way they're held high using a series of resistors that each pull up to 5 volts, and there's a set of these in each drive. This allows anything connected to this, whether it be a drive or something else, to pull these to ground without actually causing any damage. So how does this help? Well, ignoring the resistors a little, although they're still there, each floppy drive is connected to the same bus, even the Amiga's external floppy drive connector. But to keep everything working properly, a drive can only control the other signals if it has first been selected by using one of the drive select lines, and a drive should only respond to one of them. Now there's nothing technically stopping anything else from messing with these signals, and I suspect that's exactly what's going on with this device. So the pinout for the Amiga's external floppy disk connector looks like this, and it has an extra signal for reset, but it doesn't have the select signal for the internal drive. And all of these are directly connected to the internal connectors. Now I'm guessing that switch performs one simple task. When the drive's head is at the first track, this pin here, track 0, gets pulled low by the drive, but only when the drive is selected. If the disk is right protected, then this pin gets pulled low by the drive as well. My guess is that the switch simply connects pin 15, the track 0 detector, to pin 14, the right protect signal, so that each time the head is on track 0, the drive becomes right protected. However, this would also cause the reverse. If the disk was actually right protected, then the Amiga would constantly think the drive was stuck at track 0. So we probably need something else, like a diode here to prevent that. And yes, at a quick glance, that looks like it's the wrong way around, but remember here, the logic is all backwards, or negative. And I suppose for that £4.99 pence, you can't really expect there to be much more in there than this. So finally, the best bit. Let's pull it apart and see what's inside, and see if I guessed correctly. Starting by removing two screws, and then slowly pulling it apart. Well, there really isn't much inside. 
Here's a closer look. Yep, I nailed it. There's a diode connected using a switch, just like I guessed, between pins 14 and 15. Well, for just under five British pounds, I guess you can't expect that much. Sure, it does protect the... I had a little brainwave last night, and it occurred to me that this device might not be as good as it claims. You see, when you physically write protect a floppy disk, the floppy drive itself actively blocks any writing to it. But this device is messing with the write protect line on the outside of the drive, and as far as the drive's concerned, that is an output. So I started to wonder to myself, what if the reason we can't write to the disk is because the track disk dot device, part of the operating system that actually handles all the floppy disk I.O., is checking the write protect status prior to actually sending the data? I mean, that would make sense. It would save a lot of time if the disk was actually write protected. But what if we didn't use that track disk dot device? Well, to test this, I knocked up a small little program in Amos that first turns off the multitasking, sets up drive DF0, then seeks to track 0, and then it instructs the Amiga's hardware to write, via DMA, some data to the disk. And yes, I know, this technically is naughty and is certainly not OS friendly. Just switching back to Workbench here, and I'll insert the disk so you can see that it's all good. Oh, and I'll turn the protector on too. So let's run that program, and I've compiled it to make it run a little bit smoother. The delay you're currently seeing is a short calculation that's generating an MFM buffer big enough to write over an entire track. Now it's seeking back to track 0, and then writing. And then it's done! So let's see if it did anything. And it looks okay at this point, but that's because with multitasking switched off, it doesn't know anything's happened. So let's remove the disk and reinsert it. Oh dear, that's not looking good. Something's definitely happened here. I'll try and format it again. Oh, uh, strangely enough, it's still write protected. And here's a before and after of track zero from the disk. That's crazy! This device is supposed to protect against this. So this device actually provides no protection at all, because let's face it, if a virus is gonna overwrite part of a disk, why would it care if it did it in an OS friendly way? And I have to admit, I'm totally shocked by this. Oh, and for anyone who's wondering, if the disk is actually write protected, then this program doesn't write anything. So, you may as well go back to write protecting those disks, which is becoming less common with the use of Gotex, and I've recently seen several disk images with viruses on them. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Don't forget the usual thumbs up, hit that subscribe and all that stuff, and why not join me on Patreon too? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.